I talk a lot about e-ink and different types of screen technology here on my channel and well as I had this which is the IPVO P2V and it is really good at making macro shots I thought I'd get up close and personal with the Remarkable 2 and some other e-ink tablets and I also thought while I was at it well why not go the whole hog and go and look at it under this digital microscope. So I bought a very cheap digital microscope from Amazon. It had this very weird, I've never seen a USB clip like that. And I thought I would point them at some of the most popular e-ink tablets. So here we go, starting with the Remarkable 2. It's an oldie, uh, but it's a goodie. <laughs> It is a 227 ppi screen and because it hasn't got a front light you can actually see that the, the tip of the pen is pretty close to where the ink is actually coming up. There's a small distance between the top layer of the screen and the actual ink itself. So what you can see here is actually you can see the very top layer of the screen, not the ink. That bumpy surface is actually the paper feeling top surface of the screen essentially. And it's quite difficult to get it to focus on the actual ink capsules behind that. But because there isn't a front light layer, it is close enough to the top of the screen. And now we're in even closer zoom that you can actually make out the individual kind of round blobs of the ink capsules. And you can also see that grid there. And that grid is the digitizer that senses where the pen tip is. But you will see something interesting when you look at a newer technology screen in just a little while. I think it is fascinating though, seeing that up close like that. So this is the Note Air 3, which again is a 227 PPI black and white screen, but it is slightly newer. However, you can see that that front light does mean there's a bigger gap between the tip of the pen and the actual ink. You can totally ignore it, it isn't an issue at all, it's perfectly fine to write on, but when you go back from something that has a smaller gap, it is less of a realistic writing feel. For each of these shots, you've got two different zoom levels. So this is 40 times zoom and now down at a thousand times zoom. And again, you can see that paper like texture on the top, this kind of rough texture. It's quite a different sort of texture to the remarkable. And when you zoom in on this, I found it impossible to actually get focused on either the digitizer or the actual e ink capsules. And that's because the gap between the very top surface of the screen and those two elements, the digitizer and the e ink capsules is greater. So it's outside the field of focus of the lens. Now on to the newest device here, the Books Go 10.3. And this is a 300 ppi screen, again, without a front light. So you can see once more, like the Remarkable, there's a nice small distance between the tip of the pen and the actual screen. It's a very similar feel to the Remarkable indeed. And now you can again see at 40 times zoom, you can see that top surface, but you can actually see the digitizer is slightly higher up. And that is because it is within the layer of the screen, along with the ink capsules, there is actually overall less of a screen depth. Again, this time you can see in some of these shots, you can actually see the small round circles of the actual ink capsules but you can see they're blurred, they're obscured by the lumpy top layer of the screen. You can see the digitizer wires really clearly though. So with this one, I actually asked it to play a little video. So here it is zoomed right in at a thousand times zoom and looking at a video. You can see the e-ink screen refreshing. I think this was on A2 mode, which is the reasonably fast, not super fast and not the full screen refresh normal modes. You see each of the actual pixels are actually made up by multiple e-ink blobs, if you like. And so no two pixels are perfectly the exact same shape. It's fascinating, really. And 
and in this case I've zoomed back out to just 40 times zoom and you can see the same thing but just uh, on the larger scale. So next is Color Ink and this is the Books Tab Ultra C Pro. And this has a Kaleido free ink screen and that is 300 ppi in black and white but only 150 ppi in color. And you can see therefore that kind of texture of the screen. You can see the different colors, the way they're coming up through this pixelated grid compared to the black and white. And just did a full screen refresh there to show you what that looks like once it's at its best quality. And here you can see this RGB layer is actually printed on the screen. Rather than it being individual cyan, magenta, yellow and black pixels, like capsules of e-ink, it is actually a coloured grid that when it wants to display white, well, it just is has the e-ink behind it on white mode. And so you're getting all of those three colors. They're mixed together to make white, therefore. And when it wants to display black, well, behind it, you get black. And so it re doesn't reflect much light. Again, though, this does have a front light. And so it was hard to really focus in on those pixels. And you can see the pixels actually are always a little bit blurry because they're out of the focal field of the lens. But you can see the wires of the digitizer there and you can also get a good feel for how it actually works. A large area of that is actually just white space though. So you can see them there in little frees rather than in triangles like they are on a larger Kaleido free display. So I think this is one of the reasons why larger color e-ink monitors aren't looking quite as good as the smaller Kaleido free panels at this point. Hopefully though you can see why even when it's white it's never quite achieving as white a background as a black and white ink screen and that's why you're almost always having to run a front light with a color e-ink screen. Again though that front light meant that I couldn't really get focused on the actual e-ink capsules beneath and also at times you get a glimpse of the top layer of this surface on the Tab Ultra C Pro and it is less of a grippy less frictiony of a top surface. So two non-e-ink devices for comparison. This is the Lenovo P12 matte. So it has this kind of matte screen surface which emulates paper, but of course it is still underneath an LCD screen. It's an IPS panel and it has this kind of etched glass and you're gonna see that texture right now. I actually really quite like writing on this surface, but you can see from that that it is a bit more laggy than the Wacom EMR technology, which is on the other tablets. So this is the actual top surface here, and as you can see, it is very non-uniform. It is not bumpy like the other ones, but it is designed, I think, to sort of raise up or give the impression of raising up those color pixels so they look like they're on the surface. However, I found it really difficult to get a good view of the actual pixels themselves. In fact, this is the best that I've got because they are, I think, just so far beneath the top layer of the actual surface. You can just see the rectangular shape of the R, G, and B pixels there. This screen did have the most chromatic aberration though. So if I look around a white space, you can actually see the effects of refraction, meaning that the colors are separating on the edges of the white things. Lastly, I looked at an OLED panel on my Samsung Z Fold 3. And incidentally, you can really see this fold here <laughs> from this shot. And uh, it is getting worse and worse. It's almost needing its third screen replacement. But because it's Wacom EMR in the S Pen, it does have ultra low latency, even lower than any of the ink tablets. Unfortunately, it does have a very slippy top surface. It doesn't have a textured surface like paper at all. Here are the individual OLEDs. So with OLED, each pixel is made of one red, two green, and one blue. And the blue is very, very bright, as you can see that there, to give it natural colors. And those are individual LEDs and the brightness of each can be changed and therefore you can mix any individual color. Mm -hmm. 
why do you need two greens to every one red and one blue? Well, the reason is because that is the peak of our sun's visual spectrum. So all of the kind of natural colors around us generally have more green in them or higher intensity around those wavelengths than the red and the blue. But the blue light is actually the higher energy light because it's the higher energy end of the spectrum. And blue is often blamed for eye problems. And you can see the brightness is changing here as I actually flick through some photos. And if you're wondering what you're looking at, those are blades of grass. Cheers.